now at dreamsresorts.com with savings of up to 40%. Welcome to Oahu. We are on the set of NCIS Hawaii. I'm here with uh, Kevin Frazier. Stick around for more entertainment tonight. Only we are with Vanessa Lachey and Wilmer Valderrama teaming up for their big NCIS crossover. Uh-huh. Nothing wrong with a little Hawaii. Oh, I'm sure. Kevin but was, I was acting working. like he was working. Yeah. I was working. It was mm. a lot of work. Okay, before we go, <laughs> if you have a gamer in the house, you will know all about the video game Halo. Remember when it first came out? Yeah. Love the game. Well, it's now a TV show streaming on Paramount Plus, and only ET's Wilmar Fuji was at the red carpet premiere. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Nice. That's so fun. Nothing. <laughs> Did you take the job so that you could play Endless Out? Happening now. Fair County's in extreme drought conditions. And on top of that, we have a red flag warning, which makes very favorable conditions for a fire to start. Coming up, we'll hear from Fair County firefighters on what they've seen today and a demonstration on how fast a fire can spread. And I'll be talking about when this wind will finally subside, when we get a little bit of moisture back in the air, and how much warmer it'll be for the weekend in just a bit. March Madness is back in San Antonio and along with it, a very busy river walk coming up. We talked to some fans about their excitement headed into tonight's game. The News at 5 starts right now. And now we begin with breaking news. We've just learned that the family of Gilbert Flores, who was shot and killed by BCSO deputies, is being awarded over $10 million. This comes three days after testimony. The jury siding with the family of Gilbert Flores, saying deputies used excessive force in the case. Flores was fatally shot outside of his northwest side home by deputies Greg Vasquez and Robert Sanchez in August of 2015. Lawyers for the Flores family say that Flores was not a threat. Now, a bystander recorded that scene and that video showed Flotus in a 12-minute confrontation with those deputies. Seconds leading up to shots being fired, it showed that Flotus had surrendered with his hands up. Extreme drought and a red flag warning. It's a combination that puts firefighters on edge. And so far, so good right now. We haven't seen any large fires at this point. Our John Paul Barajas explains how the Bear County fire districts are working together and also setting up strike teams just in case things get out of hand. This bird's eye view of large grass fires puts into perspective how fast and far flames can spread once they hit dry grass, which essentially acts as fuel. Bear County and most of Texas are in extreme drought conditions. And to make matters worse, we have a red flag warning with 10 to 20 mile per hour winds with gusts of 30 miles per hour possible until 7 tonight. Those red flag warnings put the hair on the back of our necks up because we know with those situations, um, basically, if a fire starts, it's going to be hard to catch. Bear County Assistant Fire Chief for ESD-12, Lawrence Padalecki, gave us a demonstration of just how fast the fire can spread. In 10 seconds, and burnt through a small patch. It was heavily doused with the hose to put out, but Padalecki explained the majority of the field would have been gone in a minute. And that's just from one strike of a fire, not one spreading sparks. To combat that threat, all the county district fire units are now working together. With these type of conditions, Bear County fire crews have up staff. That way they could start strike teams of brush trucks on the east and west side. Here on the east side, they have five trucks ready to go at a moment's notice. They also did this last week because of the extreme drought conditions we've been seeing. It's basically the strike team will go and assist that department wherever it is instead of depleting the whole area from resources. He explained, although fire conditions are favorable, they've been lucky to have a slow day but adds that could change at a moment's notice. And that's a plea for residents. Don't be dragging chains if you're pulling a trailer. Don't be throwing out cigarette butts. Uh, don't be doing any burning today in your, your trash barrel or burning brush. It's just not, it's, it's not worth the risk today. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. And that red flag warning still in effect for another two hours. And as we mentioned, it means fires can start and spread very rapidly because of the very dry conditions, dry air, relative humidity down in the teens. So about 15% relative humidity out there or less. And of course, the wind, gusty wind, most recent wind gusts between 30, 20 and 30 miles per hour. But we had maximum wind gusts between 30 and 35 miles per hour today. The wind, however, is going to be quickly subsiding just over the matter of a few hours here. Look at six o'clock gusting to 22, but by seven o'clock only gusting up to 15 miles per hour and then eight o'clock maybe 10 mile per hour gusts, so much lighter winds just within a few hours. Temperatures, well, 81 in Eagle Pass, 73 though in West Kerrville, 82 in Floresville, a mixture of temperatures out there, 70s to the north and some 80s farther to the south and southwest of San Antonio. It's gonna be dry, 
Clear tonight, cooling quickly. We'll get you ready for the chill in the air tomorrow morning in just a bit. The newest drought monitor and an update on our, on our next chance of rain coming up. Adam, thank you. Now we're learning more about the two people who were killed in a crash on I-35 yesterday. Both of them were men. One was 22, the other was 42 years old. Police are telling us that nine people were in that SUV that crashed yesterday morning. Happened along the entrance ramp to Interstate 35 North at North Walter Street. Investigators say that the car's driver was trying to avoid being pulled over when they crossed two traffic lanes and right there hit a guardrail. And that's when the SUV rolled over. We're told that three people who were inside that SUV ran out and police are still looking for them. A deadly and fiery crash this morning. It happened on the city's northeast side at around 2.30 on the northeast Loop 410 area. Police say that they're still trying to figure out what went wrong here. They say that the victim was traveling north when their vehicle went off the road. It then drove through a center grassy median, went down an embankment, and then struck a wall at the Riddiman Road exit. After all of this, the vehicle caught fire. When fire crews got there, the car was full of flames. The victim in that vehicle died at the scene. Now, San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers want you to pay really close attention to what you're about to see because they're looking for a man accused of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Here's the picture right there. The victim told police that she was driving by her property when she noticed the man that you see there on the left of your screen messing with her AC unit. She then confronted him, and that's when she says the man pulled out a gun and told her to move. Happened February 6th on Harbor Place. Now, if you give information to Crime Stoppers that helps police eventually arrest that guy, you could get a $5,000 reward. And here's what you do to call Crime Stoppers. The number's on your screen. It's 210-224-STOP. In other news now, President Biden in Brussels for a trio of urgent summits with top U.S. allies. And there he announced additional sanctions against Russia and also more aid for Ukraine. After a day of high stakes emergency summits between the U.S. and key allies in Brussels, a show of unity and support for Ukraine. That's right. The president said that the U.S. will welcome up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. And he also added that the U.S. will respond if President Putin uses chemical or biological weapons as part of his war on Ukraine. We would respond. We would respond if he uses it. The nature of the response would depend on the nature of the use. Still, the Ukrainian president says that what his country really needs is more firepower. He again strongly urged NATO to provide his country just 1% of its planes and tanks. After more than 20 hours of questioning, the Senate hearings for Supreme Court Justice nominee Katanji Brown Jackson are over. Those hearings wrapped today with outside witnesses going before the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify about the judge. But one of the most emotional moments really happened yesterday when New Jersey Senator Cory Booker spoke. He brought Judge Jackson to tears when he said that she earned her spot in history. The Democrats are hoping to confirm Judge Jackson to the Supreme Court by Easter. Now to the latest on the COVID pandemic. There is some promising news for parents. Meantime, COVID test positivity in the U.S. did see a small uptick for the first time since January. The BA2 variant is fueling concerns of another surge given the increasing viral transmission occurring, occurring rather in parts of Europe. But first, we do have some good news for parents. The vaccine for children as young as six months old may soon be available. Moderna is planning to seek emergency use authorization from the FDA for its vaccines in children ages six months to six years old. It would make my life um, a lot easier just because I would have some peace of mind. There's also the question on a second booster shot. Federal regulators are considering when seniors might get their second booster and we're told a decision could, could come soon. Gas prices, yeah, we haven't stopped talking about those because they continue to be a major concern for many of you. And we all know now that some states are actually temporarily suspending gas taxes. The pain at the pump, yep, it's still hurting. And gas prices have dropped just a little bit in recent weeks. The national average now down to $4.24 a gallon. But lawmakers remain under pressure to act. Connecticut, the latest state to pass legislation to temporarily suspend the state's 25 cent per gallon gas tax. What we're trying to do with these tax cuts is do everything we can to provide a little bit of relief to people. 
In Los Angeles, the average gallon is now more than six bucks. Lawmakers across the country are appealing to the federal government for relief in a way that would kind of look a lot like those COVID era, era stimulus checks. Tejano Music, back on the FM dial across the city of San Antonio. The one and only Johnny Ramirez is back in the booth for the rebranded 95.7. That station recently switched from La Ley to an all-dedicated Tejano station. It's the first FM Tejano station in the city since April of 2019. Ramirez says that he is ready to spin the classics and also introduce listeners to a new generation of Tejano Music. There's so many young artists that are hungry to bring Tejano back to the airwaves. And why not do it in San Antonio, right? Ramirez says that it's also all about connecting the community that to something that makes San Antonio the Tejano capital of the world. Now Tejano is back on the FM dial and hopefully it's here to stay. College basketball fans descending on to San Antonio. They want some big time games tonight at the AT&T Center. That's right. The NCAA tournament is back in the Alamo City and with it a ton of excitement from fans that have made the trip to town. RJ Marquez is live at the AT&T Center surrounded by the fans and the fun. RJ, tell us what's going on. Oh yeah, we are getting ready for a big night out here at the home of the San Antonio Spurs. And guys, usually, we all know this, this place is packed with fans dressed in silver and black. But from what we've been seeing throughout the day and even coming into the arena, there's going to be a lot of red in the house because we have the Houston Cougars taking on the Arizona Wildcats. That's going to be the nightcap tonight. But before that, we have Michigan taking on Villanova. So there's just a lot of excitement coming into the arena as fans start to fill this place up. And you know what? We continue to say this but there is no better place than San Antonio to host these tournament games. And that was proven again once earlier today when we stopped by the Riverwalk. Many of these fans were out here today taking, taking advantage of the great weather and everything else that San Antonio has to offer. The Riverwalk was very busy, which is good news for local restaurants, hotels, and businesses. So we talked with fans who traveled from all over the country to watch their school play, some traveling all the way from Michigan, Tucson, the East Coast, and of course, up the road in Houston. 12 hour drive over, we came on Tuesday, get here ahead of time, kind of, we've been to uh, the river walk before, so uh, we wanted to enjoy it. We come down here just for the atmosphere by itself, but then when you add in the whole uh, collegiate atmosphere, that kind of like bumps everything else up a little bit more. We're here till Saturday, so we're really we're jacked up. The river walk area is awesome. I was here for okay. the final four in, uh, in 2018, so uh, pre-COVID, which Obviously, it's, it seems like it's almost back to normal now. San Antonio is a great place to have an event like this, so we're fired up about it. I've never been in the AT&T Center. Whose house? Kook's house. All right, and just based on the people we saw at the Riverwalk today, Houston fans are going to be well represented and very loud. Arizona as well, so the AT&T Center will be rocking for that one. And for fans coming into the arena tonight, guys, just a heads up, the San Antonio Local Organizing Committee said that while there are no COVID protocols in place inside the arena, of course, they, if you want to be on the side of caution, you can wear a mask, just anything to be comfortable and have a good time. And based on what you guys are wearing, Stephanie, with that red and Ursula wearing that yellow, you guys would fit right in here with the Michigan and Houston and Arizona fans. Also Thanks. Fiesta. Yeah, that's what it's all about. We're getting ready. We're RJ. covering all our bases Love that here. Too. All yeah. right. All right, RJ. Thanks, RJ. Thank you so much. All right. Now we're going to take another live look outside and go all the way to our south side, uh, South San Antonio. That is where you're looking at I-37 at Fair Avenue, where there is a bit of traffic. We don't know exactly what caused this, but as you can see from the scene right there, you see a couple of uh, vehicles there on the shoulder and you see a fire truck and that is slowing down traffic just a tad. So just a heads up. If if you're heading to South San, the south side of San Antonio, that there is some traffic there along I-37 at Fair Avenue. Have you picked up fast food lately? A new test shows that the wrappings on food could contain bad chemicals. 12 on your size Maryland boards tells us what you need to look out for. I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom. A look at stories that we're working on for the news at six. The story of three people who saw what was happening in Ukraine and they bought one way tickets to go help out. There's hundreds of like mothers with their children walking across the border after having walked quite literally miles because all their cars died while they were waiting in line. 
two people from Austin, one from L.A., teaming up to do whatever they can to help out. But they have experience here. They've helped out in other international disasters before, and they're using their backgrounds in nonprofits, business, and social media to get their mission out to millions. Our Courtney Friedman with that story. Plus, we're also talking about day two of the arbitration hearing for a fired SAPD officer coming up at 6. Thank you, Myra. Have you ordered fast food or takeout lately? Most of it probably came all wrapped up or boxed in one form or another. It's what's in some of that packaging that is raising concern. 12 Under Size Marilyn Morris reports there are potentially dangerous chemicals in a lot of your common food wrappers. Before you bite into that burger or sit down to that salad, a warning about the packaging. Consumer Reports tested more than 100 food packaging products from two dozen retailers for so-called forever chemicals, or PFAS. What did they find? We found PFAS in many types of packaging, in packaging from fast food restaurants and from grocery stores. We even found it in packaging from places that say they're moving away from PFAS. In general, PFAS don't break down in the environment, and they've been linked to serious health problems such as increased risk of some cancers, lower immunity, and liver damage. So if PFAS are in the packaging, are they in your food? PFAS can migrate from packaging into food you eat, like that burger wrapped in paper that contains PFAS or that salad in a molded fiber bowl. Research suggests that people who eat takeout regularly may have higher PFAS levels in their blood. Of all of the packaging tested, it's the paper bags that had some of the highest levels of PFAS. The substance is used to make the packaging grease resistant. Besides paper bags, molded fiber bowls and single use plates had the highest PFAS levels. Takeout containers and paper trays had some of the lowest. About half of the products tested had low PFAS levels. In response, some companies stressed that with PFAS so common in the environment, it's nearly impossible to eliminate them. Several are in the process of phasing them out. So what can you do in the meantime? Transfer your takeout food to another surface when you can, and don't reheat it in its packaging. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Hey, something to keep in mind when Who you knew? go out there. Yeah, well, now we know. All right, looking outside with live cam. Such a pretty day out there. Really, we're we're stringing them together now. 80 yeah. degrees. 80 degrees right now, but get ready. It's going to be one of those evenings and nights where the chill creeps up on you. So if you're going to be outside for an extended period after sunset, get ready for temperatures to fall off quickly. Yeah, we're near 80 now, but by 9 o'clock, we'll be closer to 60 degrees. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll be down into the upper 50s. And we keep falling from there. Actually, tomorrow morning, you're going to feel the chill in the air again, just like the last few mornings, about 44 degrees in San Antonio, but even cooler in outline areas. I'm going to jump into those details in a moment, but I do want to point out the trend here. Our mornings will be getting warmer. We'll add a little bit of moisture to the air. You're not going to notice any mugginess, but as we do that, our mornings will be significantly warmer by about 20 degrees by the end of the weekend and into early next week, particularly. So we will have an upward swing in those temperatures. All right, let's talk readings right now. Made it to 86 in Catula. Hey, Del Rio, 85. Meanwhile, 76 in Kerrville, New Braunfels, 79. A pleasant, comfortable afternoon. Short sleeves, A-OK, -okay, but have a light jacket ready, as I mentioned, for this evening. Hondo now 81 and Bernie, 73. So this is what we're expecting on the map tomorrow morning. 39 in Bernie and Bulverde, Timberwood Park, about 39 degrees. Canyon Lake, Smithson Valley, about 41, 40 degrees. Bandera, 39. You get the idea. Even Castorville, Port S.A., 41 degrees. So another cool start to the day. Unseasonably cool. Yeah, maybe a light jacket early, but you're not going to need it by the noon hour and by the afternoon we will top out well into the 80s and even near 90 in some locations. Hondo, Sabinal, about 90 degrees for the high temperature here in San Antonio will probably be about 87. And that's going to be the trend through the weekend and even into the early part of next week. A little dip closer to 80 on Tuesday, but not as cool as what we've been experiencing lately. We need rain. Nothing but clear skies overhead right now. Big Blue H moving over the Baja Peninsula. That's going to influence our weather for the next several days. Our next system, just like the last one, is currently near Alaska. That's going to drop near us by Tuesday, giving us a slight chance of storms. 
We'll take all the moisture that we can get. However, it looks like we'll be on the tail end of the action again. As for the newest drought monitor, it's updated every Thursday. Actually a slight improvement for the state by a couple of percentage points, 88% of the state in Texas. But for us, we've seen now the exceptional drought start to creep in Southern Mavic and Dimmick, Maverick and Dimmick counties to the southwest. 44 in the morning, nothing but sunshine. Calm winds tonight, not much of a breeze tomorrow. And those mornings warm up, afternoons in the 80s, only a 30% chance of storms Tuesday night. Thank you, Adam. All right, now let's talk about the Spurs because they are inching to the tournament. Yeah, closer to New Orleans thanks to a big win last night, but at the same time, can the Bulls help out the Spurs tonight when they play New Orleans? When we come back, where exactly did the Spurs stand at that playing tournament? We'll show you. And the head coach of the Houston Cougars will never forget the treatment he received from the Spurs helped jumpstart his coaching career again. Coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs have pulled within a half, game and a half in the New Orleans Pelicans, who only 10th and final play-in position in the Western Conference with nine games left in the regular season. And that league could be down to just one if the Chicago Bulls help out tonight with a win over New Orleans. That's because the Spurs blew out the Blazers in Portland last night, led by DeJounte Murray with 28 points. Murray scored 20 of those in the first half alone by being perfect from the field, 7-for-7. Seven seven. Calvin Johnson had 26 points, was part of the Spurs' three-esta. They had a franchise record 13 in the first half, including three in a row by DJ in the last 45 Five seconds to break the franchise record and 81 points in the first half, which is a season high in the 133-96 blowout victory. We didn't want them to come back, and you know, you let a team like that start coming back and start feeling good, then it's a it's a dog fight. So we just kept trying to hone in and keep working on, even when we had a lead, like keep working on ourselves and, and, and trying to get better. All right, a must win coming up on Saturday afternoon against New Orleans. When the fifth seeded Houston Cougars face the number one seed Arizona Wildcats tonight in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament at the AT&T Center, it will be sort of a homecoming for Cougars head coach Kelvin Sampson. You see, it was the Spurs who revived his coaching career in 2008. When and they hired him as a special advisor in the same year he was forced to resign as the head coach of Indiana for NCAA violations. And Samson has never forgotten. Yesterday I went over to the Spurs practice facility and um, of course Pop left me a bottle of wine. Really, really nice note. And a bunch of Spurs gear. <laughs> it felt like a camper. Um, except you wouldn't give wine to a camper, would you? Um, but you know, after the uh, Illinois game, I looked at my phone and I had a text from uh, uh, Bud, Mike Budenhauser. Uh, Pop, Pop has really enjoyed watching this team. He, we played Memphis in the conference championship game, uh, ever how many days ago that was. And he sent me this extended long text. Um, uh, of course, your phone starts blowing up, but RC called as soon as he found out we were going to be in San Antonio. He called me yesterday, he called me this morning. Um, you know, once you're in the Spurs family, you're, you're family for life. I mean, those are, those are great friends, and, and I'm so appreciative of uh, Pop for so many things. That is a great story. Here's the matchup tonight. Early game 629 in the AT&T Center. Late game is 859, and that includes the Houston Cougars. We'll be back after this.